I want to welcome you to part five um, of our series, Thrive. And somebody came in, and, and you know, you know, when the Spirit of God is, is at work in our midst, when we worship the Lord with all our heart, how many of you know God speaks? He'll speak to certain people. He'll just, you know, comfort. And sometimes it, it, I, I've seen this even in my own personal experience. It has nothing to do with the message that's going to be brought or even how the service is orchestrated. It's just God wanted to speak to you personally, and there's all kinds of things. And then sometimes there's some who have kind of a more of a prophetic gift where God kind of speaks to them, but it's not for them. It's for the, the general uh, church, and, and in that sense, sometimes there's, there's kind of a word of knowledge or a word of wisdom or a word of prophecy that is given. And this morning, somebody came and gave me a word that I kind of confirmed. I felt there was, uh, and it's that somebody's here today. And you feel that this grace is not for you. You feel like you're too far from the grace. And today you need to look not at to yourself, not at to your past, not at to your historical uh, history, but to look at him because he's accomplished everything for you on that cross. And that's what changes our identity. Amen. And so if that's you today, listen, everybody could get grace and mercy today. Uh, you may not feel worthy of it, but Jesus died for you and me. Uh, and uh, how many would say amen to that? Amen. And I could stop right here. That's a message. And it's a, that is the core foundation of our faith. I want to welcome you to part five uh, of a series we started uh, entitled Thrive. It's a series of messages that explores spiritual disciplines that helps us prosper spiritually so that our soul prospers. Would you say amen to that? 1 Timothy 4, 7 says, Have nothing to do with godless myths and old wives' tales. Rather, train yourself to be godly. This series provides different ways that we can train and exercise ourselves to be godly. And uh, as I mentioned uh, in the past weeks, godliness and spiritual health doesn't just happen. Uh, you, you don't just wake up godly. Uh, you don't just, you know, go to church and somebody zaps godliness into you or, you know, receive the anointing of godliness. No, you don't, you got to, you got to exercise. Me, you and I need to do this for ourselves. We need to exercise and, and train ourselves to be godly. Are you good so far? We need to apply and implement these spiritual disciplines in our habits, in our routines, in our lifestyle, and purposely, and I would say this, and purposely plan them out. Because if you don't purposely plan them out, how many know we won't do it? We may, the chances of us doing it are very slim. And not just to do it spontaneously. I mean, I'm all for spontaneous. I'm all for spontaneous giving and spontaneous prayer and spontaneous grabbing a verse of the Bible and spontaneous worship and spontaneous serving. But we need backbone. We need something consistent because spontane, being spontaneous is not consistent. Being spontaneous is not a discipline. Spontaneous does not guarantee because spontaneous depends on how I feel that day. Sponta spontaneous depends on my circumstances, my current circumstances. So if I only pray when I feel like praying, how I many you know I ain't going to be praying a lot? <laughs> if I only give at Christmas time or on times where I'm really touched on the TV with tears, like really a lot of tears and a couple of Kleenex box. And that's when I'm going to give? How many of you know I'm not going to grow as a Christian? If I only lift up my hands towards heaven and praise God when I feel like it, then I'm not growing as a believer. The true Christian faith is not going to work for me if I'm only a spontaneous Christian. We need spiritual discipline. And everybody say, Amen! Amen. Because my Bible says that Jesus is calling for disciples not spontaneous Christians who will only obey His Word when they feel like it. My Bible says that Jesus is calling disciples, not spontaneous Christians who are hot one day and cold the next. Are you following so far the logic of this? So this is why we must exercise, develop spiritual disciplines so we could be all that God has called us uh, to be. So far in our series of messages, we looked at and all these messages, you could watch them on, online on our website. We looked at the spiritual discipline of fasting. 
the spiritual discipline of devotion, of stewardship. Last week with Pastor Bethy, the discipline of worship. Today I want to talk about a different discipline. We're going to conclude next week, uh, the sixth part next week. So uh, it's a six-part message. We're going to talk today about the spiritual discipline of service. Amen? Let's pray together. Father, we thank you so much that your word says that you did not come to be served, but to serve. Lord, when you washed the feet of your disciples, you took the most humble position, the most humble servant position. You that is the king, you took the most humble spot and washed the feet of your disciples and you said, you go and do likewise. Lord, I pray today as we open your scriptures and your word and your instructions that, Lord, you would just create in us a heart of a servant and help us to uh, practice and develop the discipline of service. We ask this in Jesus' name, and everyone say, Amen. Amen. It was Joshua in Joshua 24, verse 15, that said and declared, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. If that's your prayer, I want you to repeat that after me and declare like Joshua, As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Hey, you're not loud enough. Let's do it again. You don't say it like you mean it. As for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. Amen. Amen. In this scene, we see Joshua calling all the tribes. You can read it at home if you want in, jo in Joshua four, uh, 24. But Joshua is calling all the tribes of Israel. He summoned all the elders, all the leaders, all the judge, all the officials in Israel. And he called them to present themselves before God. It was a divine rendezvous. Joshua had a word of the Lord, a thus says the, the Lord, and he was about to speak to them, and he, and he summoned them to church. He summoned them to a gathering, a divine rendezvous, and it says that Joshua said to all the people, thus says the Lord God of Israel, your fathers, including Terah, who is the father of Abraham, and the father of Nerah, dwelt on the other side of the river in old times, and they served other gods. So in other words, you, some of you, your fathers did not serve the Lord. Some of you come from non-Christian backgrounds. They served the other gods on the other side of the river. And even Abraham, you'd think, you look at Abraham, you know, the father of faith, you know, a man that God speaks highly of and used greatly and has such a, an impact in the history of Christianity. You think he came from a good, goody, goody two-shoes home. But it says that his father served other gods. He comes from a non-godly home. And he says, I understand some of you come from non-Christian homes. And then he gives another history lesson. And he tells them about what God did for them as a nation, as a people of God, as children of God. This is what God has done. And he begins to talk about how he delivered them from Egypt and how he delivered them from slavery, how he protected them in times when people had bad intentions and evil intentions towards them, how God gave them things they didn't even work for or labored for or sold for. How God protected them when some enemies wanted to take their land and how they rose against them and how God gave them victory in their battles. And then at the end, he gives them a choice after he talks about their history, where, which house they come from, your father's house, and then he talks about what God has done. Then he gives them a call to action. He gives them a choice. Verse 15, choose for yourselves. Everybody say, choose for yourselves. Choose for yourself. Turn your neighbor and say, that's for you. you do. Choose for yourself. This day, whom you will serve. Whether the gods which your fathers serve that were on the other side of the rivers or the gods of the Amorites uh, in, in whose land you dwell. In other words, uh, you choose if you want to serve the gods your fathers worship or the gods of this land that you're in. But as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. He gives them a choice. I love this because he says, choose for yourself. Mommy and daddy cannot choose for you. Honey or your, however you call your husband, can't choose for you. He can't choose for you. She can't choose for you. Choose for yourself. 
I can't choose for you. Choose for yourself. This day. Meaning, don't procrastinate. This is such an important decision that you should decide today. Don't procrastinate. Don't put it off. Tomorrow is not guaranteed. Tomorrow you may not have a guarantee to make that choice. Choose this day whom you will serve. Because maybe up until that day, some people were not decided. Maybe a little bit of daddy religion and a little bit of land religion and a little bit of the Lord's religion or the Lord's relationship, you know, a little bit of, of a spiritual new age where it's a, like a spiritual banquet of all the religions packaged in one. Or maybe some of them never thought of it, you know, never thought of that, just didn't think about that. I'll think about that one day when I'm sick in the hospital kind of deal. He says, choose this day. You know, and he says, you know, whatever your decision you make, it's not going to change mine because I've already settled it. I've already decided. As for me and my house, we've already made that decision. We got that set. We, we've, we've planned that. You know, my, um, we have to make that decision because we don't know tomorrow what will happen. My, my father, um, when, when I was 13, my father passed away when he was 37. He had a, a heart attack, and he died in front of us on the spot. We never have any warning. No doctor says you gotta be, better watch your cholesterol. You got to watch the beer. You're drinking a little too much. Uh, better watch. No, we, he just died in front of us at, at 37. And I was like, no notice, no countdown. Uh, just a couple of weeks ago, I, had the, I, I attended the memorial for my grandmother. And, and both my grandma and my grandfather, we had a countdown. You know, they, they went from their house to a senior's home to the hospital and then to the emergency room. Everybody got kind of a countdown. We knew this was going to happen. We knew it was just a question of when and the timing, but we had, we had great moments to say goodbye. We had great moments to, for them to get their house in order. And they, in my opinion, they, they were blessed because they got a countdown. And both of them accepted the Lord on their deathbed. They were able to give their lives to Christ. My dad, I don't know what happened. He just died on the spot. And I, I want to encourage you today that we don't know if we're going to get a countdown. We don't, have that, we don't know if we're going to have that luxury of knowing when we're going to go and having a few days to get our affairs in order and making peace with God. And so Joshua says, choose this day. You know, we, we, you're going to a week on a vacation. How much time you prepare for that one week you're going to go to Mexico, Cancun, all of these things that you're getting excited. You're like, well, I'm, I may go on the travel site after service and plan my vacation. But... You know, somebody goes a week on a vacation, how much time do you spend preparing for that, for that event? Or even one anniversary or one wedding ceremony or one event that we plan so much for, and that's important. And but sometimes we don't make any planning for the eternity that awaits us. Joshua says, choose for yourself this day. And so today, if you're here today and you haven't made that choice of who you're going to serve, who are you going to live your life for? Who are you going to believe? If you're going to receive Christ in your life, if you haven't made that choice today, I'm going to give you the opportunity today, and maybe just for one person, that you could leave this place today knowing that you made peace with God. You made peace. You got your affairs in order today. And I, I wish you a long life. I, live for you. I, I wish you live, you break the records of 120 or whatever the record of living on this earth. But after you read the Bible about heaven, you're like, I don't want to live that long. You know, I'll do my 84 years and that's it, you know. I did my time on this earth, I'm going home. Uh, but, you know, I, I wish you long life. But how many know that that's an important thing to prepare? Choose for yourself this day who you will serve. Now, why am I bringing this up in this discipline of service? Is I want you to know that this comes out of worship. Because the word Choose who you will serve. That word in some of your Bibles, it doesn't say serve. It says choose today for yourself whom you will worship. That word worship and that word serve is from the word in Hebrew, and I'm, I'm going to massacre that language, but it's abad. It's not bad, right? Uh, abad, which means to work for, to serve, 
to worship. It's from the same root word in Hebrew, Abba. So to serve God is part of worshiping God. And that's what I want you to know is that whatever we talk about a discipline of service, we're talking about something that flows from our worship to God. Choose this day for yourself who you will worship, who you will work for, who you will live for, and in some case, who you will die for, who you will serve. Is it going to be the gods of your father, the gods of this land, the god of mammon that Jesus called the god of money? Or is it going to be Jesus? Matthew 6, 24, Jesus says, None can have, no one can serve two masters. Either you will hate one and love the other, or you will be devoted to the one and despise the other. You cannot serve both God and money. Choose for yourself, this day, who you will serve. Because as for me and my house, we will serve the Lord. To so serve God out of worship. You know, I like how the zoning department puts it. You know, this is, a, um, you know, the last place we were it was a commercial unit. We rented two commercial units. And when we decided to have services there. Uh, we needed to add to the existing zoning because it was a commercial zoning. We needed to ask permission and apply for a, um, an addition to the commercial zoning. And they call it, and this is how they call it, they call it a place of worship. To have a church in a spot, you need a zoning called a place of worship. And I think it's so beautiful, isn't it? Because that describes the gathering. Not the church, but the church, uh, the, the church gathering. The Sunday gathering, when we meet on Sunday on the Lord's Resurrection Day and we meet the people of God together, I believe it describes it well, that this is a place of worship, a place of worship. And that's what it says on the little paper of, uh, of legal paper. It says it's a place of worship. That's what happens here on a Sunday. Because we, when we get together, we, we worship God in songs and in praise. We're vocal about our love for God. We're vocal about how we're grateful and thankful to Him. We worship God in our tithes and in our offering when God has blessed us with work and the ability to work. We give back a portion to Him, and that's worship. When we proclaim his word, we announce the word, we teach the word, we preach the word. I'm only speaking to myself here. Uh, but that's worship. When we hear his word, that's you, that's us. When you hear his word and you're praying in your heart that you be able to apply it as you walk out, that's worship. And we worship God, and there's many different forms of but we worship God when we serve God, when we serve the body of Christ, when we serve the church with our God-given gift. Coming to church on Sunday is not simply coming to listen to someone preach. Coming to church is so much more than that. And if we describe church, the, the church meeting or the church gathering on a Sunday morning in one word, it would have to be worship. We worship God. Worship service. And we worship God by serving God. Now, how do we serve God? How, how do, what does serving God look like? One of the biggest tragedies happening today in, in some churches, and I'm not the one saying this. This is people who have a lot more experience in the church and, and travel a lot. Uh, and they've seen it, is, is that um, is, is people believe that, you know, if we have paid staff, the work of ministry is covered. They're going to do, we're going to hire some professionals to do the ministry work, and we're going to sit there and watch them. And I know that's not you. It's in the other churches like that, though, because, you know, we don't have many staff here. But in the other stuff, it's like that. I, I've been there. I, I, I take my word for it. Uh, it's like that. I'm not here. You guys are a good bunch, but uh, <clears throat> we're going to delete that from the recording. So we don't offend all the other churches around. Uh, <laughs> but it's true. We get the idea that if we have some staff, they're going to take care of the ministry part. We're going to sit there and watch 
I, ag I agree with um, Reynold Bunke, what he said. Through the years, a fundamental disconnect between uh, the two parts of the church, commonly known as the clergy and the lady, it's a year concept of ministry, has evolved, which has segregated the two groups. This has resulted in a crippled system in which the career ministers who are in min minority of the church have assumed the majority of the work of the ministry. Meanwhile, the rest of the body, the majority, have been taught that they are not qualified for ministry and have been reduced to a crowd of spectators. But when you read Ephesians 4, Ephesians 4 talks about God giving the church apostles, prophets, pastors, teachers, and evangelists. The concept that emerged when you read this is that those five vocal or vocational ministries, if it was going to be compared to a football game, they're the water boys. They're supposed to be on the bench giving you a towel, giving you encouraging, giving you coaching, giving you the tools you need, giving you the right sneakers if you need them, to giving you the water you need. They're the encourager while you're out there throwing the football, while you're out there being a lawyer, being a doctor, being a nurse, being a government worker, being a public servant, being a police officer, being a, you could say amen anytime you know, being a stay-at-home mom, being a teacher, being a student, being a contractor, a plumber. And we've switched that around. We say, let, let the five vocational ministries, full-time people do the ministry while we go and watch them. While it's the other way around. They're supposed to equip us. They're supposed to, they're supposed to edify us and teach us and train us so that when we get out of these doors, of this place, we could shinely bright the love of Jesus out there with the gifts God gave us. Are you following Turn to your neighbor and say, I'm glad I'm not the water boy. <laughs> Serving God was never intended just for preachers and those who give their time fully to the work of God, like apostles, teachers, pastors, prophets, and evangelists. Every believer is called in some capacity or another to serve God. And that's going to look different. That's going to look different for everybody. It could be public. It could be teaching, preaching. It could be leading uh, in songs and worship. It could be playing an instrument. Like it could be like that lady that I believe is my wife, or maybe not my wife, or somebody's in there, bless her heart, taking care of the kids in the nursery. My wife. Yeah, there you go. Tell her I told you that, right? Brownie points, right? <laughs> It could be a public ministry like it could be behind the scenes. It could be playing an instrument or helping with the kids' church a couple times a month or a couple months. Once every couple of months. It could be with Hands of Hope. It could be with Ambrim Campus, you know. I forgot that, you know, with the new church in a, in a rented space, sometimes there's this thing called set up and tear down. We forgot about that. And so when we're putting the speakers and we need to show up a couple, you know, an hour earlier just to set up the speakers, we forgot about that. You know, that's how it was for years here when we started. And so some people are serving God right now in Embram as they're putting those speakers up. They're serving in the set up tear down. Serving coffee after the service. Greeting the people. Counting. The blessing of God on this church. Leading a connection group on Tuesday or on Saturday or on Friday. Gra graphic design or the marketing side of Facebook and all the social media. Sound and projecting. Serving on the pastor's council. Helping with the youth ministry. Visiting people when they're sick at the hospital. Sending someone an encouraging word by email or calling them out for some coffee and spending some time with them. The abilities to serve in this church or through this church or any church are countless. And I've just named you, I've just mentioned some examples to you, but there's some people that actually serve God outside of the box. Meaning there is no ministry to describe what they're doing. We had a lady here, and I, I overshared this story, but I'm, I'm so amazed at how God brought the right people to make this happen. There's a lady who lost 
She was in a tough season in her life. Some of you remember her for a time in her church, and she was in a, a season in her life where she lost practically almost everything. And, uh, you know, she's been a housewife for so, so many years. Her husband was a, a company man, and he, he brought all, in all the money, and she never, she never needed a job back in those days until one day the, 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 he decided to, to stop the marriage, and so that meant she needed to find some way to get some income. And uh, she couldn't do that because she didn't finish high school. And she's in her 50s, I believe, at that time. And so she's got to go back to school in her 50s. And uh, one couple here took it to heart to, to help her through this process and tutor her. And not only tutor her, she, she, she ended up, I, I, I think she ended up in the high grades when she graduated. And today she's some kind of PSD worker in Barrie and she's doing really well. And, and, and to me, th th we didn't have a bulletin sheet with saying, come and help us tutor this lady. This is somebody that had to heart to just help her out. She says, the reason I came to your church is not because I know you, I heard you preach, or I know anyone in your church. She says, I saw the name New Beginning. And I'm in a season right now where I need a new beginning. So that's why I'm coming to your church. What denomination you guys are again? I came because of the name. I felt compelled. I need a new beginning, God. And she got her new beginning, amen? amen? And that's because people stepped out of the box and served somebody, helped somebody out. I hear about people helping people just that don't have cars and they're giving them rides to the grocery store to get their stuff in order. That's serving. That's serving. We're starting to get a reputation of you guys, of the people that I have the food bank saying, oh, I heard you guys give rides to the food bank. I said, you, you heard that? <laughs> we do that? <laughs> we actually do. I didn't even know. You just taught me that we do that, you know. You're getting a reputation out there. So I feel like this message is useless. You already practice it. We do a volunteer, a worker appreciation evening. We got half the church showing up. Maybe it's for the free pizza or I don't know. <laughs> I look at Wallace. Where is Wallace? I saw Wallace. Oh, I look at Wallace over there. And uh, there's one guy I know. He, he, he struggles with, um, he's kind of a bipolar. He's been diagnosed as a bipolar and he, he, he would move somewhere for a month, and it's a miracle if he would stay there more than a month because he would just, whatever the reason, he'd move out somewhere else. And Wallace actually moved him about five, six times in a short span of time. <laughs> and so some people have decided to serve outside of the box. So I've presented some ministries that are there that we need help, and you could serve, you could grow by serving. It, it doesn't have to be every week. It could be once a month, once every odd month. But there's also, don't be limited to what happens here during the four walls. There's different ways we could serve the body of Christ. We could serve the community in the name of Christ. It could serve. There are countless ways we can serve. In the New Testament, we're not just called children of God. We're also called servants of God. Because there's an expectation that we're going to serve. We're going to work. We're going to bless. We're going to use our talents and our giftings and give back to the work of God. Someone says service as a spiritual discipline is practiced for two reasons. One, to serve others. And two, to sacrificially uh, grow into Christ-likeness. Now, there are myths. There are myths about service. I'm going to rush quickly. I really have no, no more time. Uh, myth number one about service is God needs me. Acts 17, 24 says, The God who made the world and everything in it, being Lord of heaven and earth, does not live in temples made by men, nor is he served by human hands, as though he needed anything since he himself gives to all mankind life and breath and everything. So the myth is, God needs me, so that's why I'm going to help out. I want, you, I want you to see it differently now. I want you to see it. It's not necessarily God needs us. It's that it's a privilege for us to serve God. That God wants us to join him in that mission. I've learned through the years of being a, a, a believer that... Um, 
God, if I'm not going to do what God called me to do, God's going to raise somebody else to do it. That I'm not irreplaceable. We, we learned this from uh, Saul. When Saul had to step down, God raised up a David. We learned this when um, Elijah went to be with the Lord. God raised up Elisha. We learned this from when Moses, great spiritual man Moses, like who, how would you fill in the shoes of a guy like Moses? Who would, who would he delegate or pass the torch to. And as he died, God raised up Joshua. When Judas betrayed Jesus and betrayed the whole group of disciples, he was replaced with Matthias. And so we're not irreplaceable. Although you are valuable, we're not irreplaceable. God could always find somebody else. It's a privilege we have. I remember my oldest son, he always wants to help out. And so when I was uh, mowing the, the lawn, he wanted to help me mow the grass. And so he would come and, you know, he would help me push the, the lawnmower. Um, and, uh, and that's a beautiful example of how God allows us to serve him. And, and, and the privilege we have to serve him is that he wasn't doing much. Who knows who was doing all the, pull, uh, the pushing? I was doing the pushing. In fact, it was slower when I was doing it with my son because I didn't want him to get hurt. I didn't want to step on his foot. But he felt so good because he's like, I mowed the lawn. And he said, you didn't mow the lawn. We mowed the lawn, you know. <laughs> and so here he is. He's mowing the lawn with me. And he thinks he mowed the lawn, but he didn't mow the lawn. I, I pushed the thing. And, I, and it was slower for me. But just the fact that he was helping me, he felt good about it. And it's like that with God. He, he, we, everything we do is because of his giftings, of his strength, of his ability of his inspiration. How many times have I found myself under the desk saying, Lord, give me a word for Sunday. And he gives, he gives everything we need. So it's a privilege. God doesn't need us. It's a privilege we have to serve God. And so that's kind of something sometimes we need to be reminded of. Myth number two is, and maybe some of you, this is not for you, but there, there are some. Uh, serving God is easy and effortless. I don't know about that one. <laughs> I haven't, uh, and, and, and it's not just experiences, it's the Bible. 1 Corinthians 15, 58, just that one verse alone will, will, will make you think differently. It says, always give yourself fully to the work of the Lord because you know that your labor in the Lord is not in vain. Just chew on these words for a second. It says always. Always means discipline. Always means constant. Constance uh, always means it's not spontaneous. Always give. Give talks about sacrifice. It, it talks about, it's not about you, it's about others. It talks about sharing. Yourself, give yourself fully. That means commitment, dedication. Put your heart, your 100% into it. Put excellence into it. How many are seeing hard work so far? <laughs> always give yourself fully to the work, that word work, to the Lord. And then it says, because we know that your labor. Now it goes from work to labor. Labor is hard work. It's not just work, it's hard work. And so serving God doesn't mean it's always going to be easy. Serving God doesn't mean it's always going to be effortless. In fact, our, our principal in Bible college used to say, serving God is 10% inspiration, 90% transpiration. <laughs> I don't know if that's an English word, but in French it, sound, it sounds good. It sounds great. Transpiration, yeah. You guys don't get it? My goodness, you got to learn French, you know. <laughs> Myth number three. Serving is a is a form of volunteering for a charity. Although it, it may look like that, but I'm not going to say much because my understanding of a volunteer is he doesn't get paid. My Bible says if you serve God, God will reward you. <laughs> so technically you will get paid for it. Amen? So we're not volunteers, we're workers. We're servants of Christ. Amen? Myth number four, people involved are... are I couldn't even read my own notes. People in, there's so many people involved that there's no need for me to get involved. 
And so maybe you're here today and you say, well, I'd like to serve, but I feel like there's a lot of people already involved. They don't need me. Let me tell you, we do need you. God doesn't need you. We need you. <laughs> Jesus says that the harvest is plentiful, but the laborers are few. So there's not a shortage of work. There's not a shortage of harvest. There's a shortage of workers. And I encourage you, if that's you, if that's why you're hesitating, uh, to start praying, Lord, where do you want me to serve? How can I serve? How could, what gift you've given me so that I could give back and serve so that the body could be built up? Um, what happens when everybody uses their gifts? I'm, I'm, I'm sorry, I really don't have any time to go into detail here, but I had all my notes. My notes are blessed right now because it made sense in my notes, but I couldn't share this with you, uh, is that if everybody does what they're supposed to do in terms of service, the church not only grows numerically, but the number of disciples multiply. In Acts chapter 6, you want to read this at home, we have the apostles uh, who are there and they hear a complaint because the church is growing. The, the disciples are growing. They're multiplying. But then, you know, there's these, these ladies and widows that are not being served at the table. They're, there's a neglect, a neglect that's happening. And so they complain to say, our, you know, our widows are not being cared for. And so the apostles, they met together, the 12, they met together, and they say, well, it wouldn't be right for us to, to neglect the work of preaching the word and, and of ministering the word. So let's choose some people, seven men who are filled with the spirit, who have wisdom and have a good reputation. And so they established these people to serve at the table. And it says that the church kept growing and multiplying. The number of disciples continued to multiply. When you and I tap into what God has called us to do and we serve the church, that's what happens. The church grows. The disciples grow. People are built up. Amen? Can I ask the worship team to come so that we could pretend to everybody I'm concluding? <laughs> First Peter 4.10 says, each of you, everybody say each of you, should use whatever gift you have received to serve others as faithful stewards of God's grace in its various forms. In other words, God given us all one gift. Some of you have more than one gift, but we all have a minimum of one gift. You're wondering, well, how do I know which gift I got? Well, I encourage you, we put a tool, a free tool on our website they could do what we call a spiritual gift test. And it's a series of questions, and it's not the voice of the Holy Spirit, but it's tool in place that will help you know where you're strong, where you're, you seem to be gifted in. And it helps you see where you're, where, where you're good. So I encourage you to do the test. There's books in our libraries that are written specifically on spiritual gifts that helps you to understand how to identify your spiritual gifts. Because we need to ask the question, are we supposed to serve in every department, in every ministry, every need that we see? Are we, are we supposed to say yes to every need that is in front of us? Or should we serve where we're kind of wired? Or should we serve where God has called us to serve? And I, I believe there's a yes in both questions, or both answers. There are times where I serve in places I know I'm not wired. I know I'm not gifted, gifted in accounting. But I, I, I pull out the calculator, calculator here and there, and then I call the accountant to see if I'm doing the right thing. But I do administrative work, although I'm not an administrator. I do push the mop around, even though I'm not a concierge, janitor. There you go. We do things out of need sometimes, even though that's not our gifting and calling. But I think most, the high percentage of our time should be where we're called, where we're gifted. Because if everybody does what they're gifted to do, everybody benefits. When teachers teach, when evangelize, evangelists teach others how to evangelize, when pastors pastor, when administrator administers, when leaders lead, 
when servant serves, when those with the gift of mercy help those who are broken, when encouragers encourage, everybody wins. Everybody wins. Can we stand? I want to ask you if you don't mind just we're, we're going to conclude and just bow your your heads for a moment close your eyes I'm, I want to do two invitations I want to do an invitation for somebody here today who has not made that choice of who they're going to serve or who they're going to live for who they're going to give their life to and then I want to give an invitation to the rest of us who would just pray say Lord I want me and my house to serve you I just don't know where to start I, I, I don't know where you want my time to be. You know I, I have responsibilities. I've got a house. I've got, I've got a job, a full-time career. And the little time that I have, left, I don't know what to do with it. And, 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 and you would pray God to show you how to use that time and where to serve. But first, I want to give an invitation to someone who's maybe here. You never made that decision to give your life to the Lord. You say, today, I want to make a decision to to serve the Lord, to follow the Lord, to worship the Lord. I want to give my life to Jesus. Maybe this is your first time you're going to do this, or maybe you're coming back to Him. As every eyes are closed, I'm going to ask you before God, this is, this is between you and God, to lift up a hand and say, God, I receive you today. Lord, I receive you in my life as my Lord and Savior. I receive your forgiveness. I receive your mercy. I want to live for you. I've been living for the world. I've been living for money. I've been living for the cares of this world for long, and Today, I choose to serve you, to live for you, to worship you. My parents were not godly. Uh, the, my father's house were following all these other gods. Uh, uh, and today, I choose to serve you. I'm going to ask you to slip up a hand and say, this is my decision. I choose for myself this day that from this day on, I'm following the Lord. I'm going to follow the Lord Jesus Christ. Hallelujah. Other people are here, and I'm inviting you to say, I want to, I want to serve the Lord. It, it doesn't matter. I'll push the mop if I have to. I'll lead a Bible study. I'll, I'll pour some coffee. I'll greet some people. Uh, I'm going to help with the kids once every two months or, or whatever else. God, show me what to serve. You're saying, I, I'm making a decision that I'm not just going to be a spectator and watch some professionals do their work, although I don't see any professionals here. But you're saying, I, I'm going to be part of the church. I'm going to serve the church. I'm going to be part of, uh, of those who worship and serve God. If that's you, I'm going to ask you to slip a hand up and say, I'm going to serve God. I want to serve God with my giftings. I want to serve God with my time. God bless you. Anybody else to say, I'm coming to serve God. However I can help, Lord, use me. Send me. Hallelujah. For the advancement of your kingdom. Whether it's in the nursery. Whether it's tutoring. Whether it's giving lifts to people who can't make it here on Sunday or can't go to the grocery stores whether it's to help people during the week or visit people at the seniors' home or in the hospital or to host my house for a Bible study or to cook once in a while, to go sing at the seniors' residence. I want to serve you, God. I want it to be true that me and my house shall serve the Lord. Maybe there's one person here God's put in your heart to preach. And although I, I promise you, you will not have a microphone tomorrow. You say, Lord, what are the steps for me to stir up that gift? What are the steps for me to prepare myself? Begin to watch people who do it. Begin to learn. Stir up the gift. Read books about it. Ask the Lord to help you and equip you and stir you up and, and sharpen you in that gift. Others as gifts of encouragement. Say, Lord, put somebody in my path who's discouraged. I could encourage them with the, encourage them in the Lord. Somebody who's on the verge of giving up on their marriage. Help me to encourage them. Somebody who's about to give up on the Lord and give up on their ministry. Help me to encourage them. Give them a word of encouragement. Gifts of mercy. Gifts of hospitality. Gifts of generosity, Lord. Gifts of administrative uh, administration and leadership. 
gifts of healings, all the gifts. God, I pray today for my brothers and sisters and myself. I pray today, God, that this church will lack no good gifts. Thank you for stirring up the gifts that you've given unto us. And for others, I thank you, Father, for showing them and giving us the, the discernment as to what gifts you've given us and so that we could be faithful stewards, faithful administrators of the gifts you've invested in us so that we could serve the church so that they could be built up, encouraged and edified, so that the church could grow and multiply so that more people would hear about Jesus in this community of Prescott Russell. Thank you for spiritual gifts, Lord. Thank you for ministerial gifts. Thank you for motivational gifts. All of them, Lord. All the gifts. Thank you for filling this church with all the gifts that we need to take us from where we're at to where you want to take us, to build people up. And I pray as the days go by, the weeks go by, that, Lord, it would become evident to all of us what part of the body we are. That for some, they're arms, and for, those, for the others, they're foot. For others, they're a mouth, and those are, some are ears, and whatever it is, Lord, help us to really function in the diversity of the body of Christ. You've called us in the midst of diversity. Thank you for unity. I pray your blessing upon your people in Jesus' name and everyone say, come on, let's put our hands together to see what the Lord will do in our lives and how he will use us.